I want to pivot over to something we spoke about at the start. Susie, just around your thoughts on human rights of armed forces personnel and technology. Yeah, I think it's an incredibly interesting area that we'll see. And I mean, you know, you will be very well aware of, you know, the military sphere being a real space for tech innovation, particularly. And what we've heard a lot when we talk about, you know, um, the technological developments in warfare, we hear a lot about the impacts on the ground, if you like, sort of the victims of war. But one of the areas that hasn't been much discussed, but where there are starting to be discussions again, on, you know, in fora like the OSCE, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, is looking at what does it actually mean for the human rights of armed forces personnel? What does it mean for the people who are using this um, technology? Um, and the, the right to freedom of thought and the kind of questions of agency and autonomy, I think, are really crucial in this space. Um, one of the areas of, of development is about sort of brain computer interfaces. And so how do armed forces personnel feel about what is the impact of them on them of being, you know, fused with a computer, if you like, how, how, how does that affect how they feel about what's happening, about the impact of what they're doing on the ground, about their ability to control. And I think there's been some interesting research in Australia uh, about how armed forces personnel feel and, and are in a way sort of reluctant, if you like, to engage in warfare in a situation where they don't have ultimate control, where they feel that, you know, the computer is, is taking over, if you like, and that they're losing um, their humanity. There's also, you know, about augmentation, the use of technology to sort of augment cognitive ability and that sort of thing, which raises big questions again of consent. Uh, you know, what happens if we're trying to create superhumans in a, in a military space? You know, what happens to those that feel that they have to um, be subjected to this sort of enhancement? What happens to those that refuse? Um, and so they're quite kind of big and fundamental questions about, about what it means to be human right at this kind of, you know, right on the front line. I mean, literally um, on the front line. Yeah. Can attest to that, Susie. Uh, 10 years in the military, spent a lot of that time at the forefront of those new technologies and being deployed in, you know, uh, operational theaters across you know, the Middle East and, and even in counterterrorism uh, for the protection of the Australian New Zealand borders. Um, so I can attest to that. And, you know, you're talking about the counterterrorism piece earlier and my first introduction to human rights was uh, a briefing pack that we got from a human rights lawyer. Uh, and my initial reaction as a young, uh, um, a young testosterone charged male in the military and special forces was I'll pay this off. You know, it's one of those things, but my mentor kicked me into gear pretty quickly and said, this is your legal prehabilitation in the hope that you never need to do legal rehabilitation. Yeah. Uh, and that changed my world because every time, every time we went into theater, every time we had new technology, the first question asked by the team was, has someone from human rights or the legal teams looked over this and what's our remit for, uh, how do we leverage this technology without needing legal repercussions as a result of leveraging this technology? Yeah. So that was my first interaction with human rights. Yeah. It was profound for me. Yeah, no, I think absolutely. Um, it is really crucial. And I mean, you know, in the military sphere, whether you're talking about it in sort of terms of humanitarian law or, or human rights law, you know, it, it's absolutely crucial to what you're doing and to, you know, how you view yourself, you know, um, but also this kind of question of how, how it impacts you. And, and there's also some interesting research, uh, that I saw relating to the U S and sort of post nine 11 world and how, you know, the, the shift towards more remote warfare meant that, um, there was a sort of lowering of deaths on the front line or, you know, in armed combat. So that kind of went down and also improvements in medical interventions that meant that, you know, people could be cured much more effectively, but that also that meant that people were being redeployed. So instead of, you know, doing your, your time and then moving on, people were being redeployed just sort of on a, on a churn and that actually the rate of suicides in U S, um, military and former military had kind of gone through the roof. 
since 9-11. So you're seeing, you know, people being killed on the front line, but the mental health impacts and the, you know, ultimately the human rights impacts on those people are massive in a way that maybe hadn't been thought through. Yeah, we're seeing a, a similar story in Australia at the moment, Susie. Unfortunately, we're losing a veteran a week at the moment to suicide okay. um, as a direct result of, of impacts from from war. But it's it's a true statement in that uh, with with the remote capabilities of warfare, there is certainly a, a difference in in the soldier. Um, but we're seeing more of a critical thinking soldier. Um, and you mentioned the conscientious conscientious objector earlier. Um, yeah. There's a lot more power given to junior soldiers to be able to say no in their in their right as a belief or their freedom to, of thought yeah. in how they want to act and and enact uh, the the kinetic action on the ground, whether that's in remote warfare or whether that's actually on the ground fighting uh, the front line. Yeah. So it's interesting, but uh, from the US side, I've got a few US counterparts who they get deployed into a container at the back of a warehouse. Um, but they're operating remote capabilities from that warehouse. So whilst their brain is fixated on the screen, they're in a theater of deployment. They're actually deploying technologies from the other side of the world. So therefore, you know, that they're, they're talking about the impact of empathy in warfare is being completely removed because yeah. of the remote aspect of of warfare. Yes, yeah, the gamification of war, right? That um, yeah. that then becomes incredibly difficult to sort of engage in your daily life. And I think all of those things have really profound implications for our, for our freedom of thought, our ability, you know, that, that inner freedom, how we feel, how we think, uh, and how we sort of nurture that in order to be able to engage with each other. Uh, and, and if you like that private space, that inner sanctuary is what gives us our ability to then connect with each other. It's, it's, you know, we need that private space in order to have meaningful connections outside. And when that's being warped in that kind of way, you know, we, we are then losing our ability to, to engage as societies. Susie, all in all, are you still pretty optimistic about the future? I absolutely am actually. I mean, I, I, you know, and I hope that that comes through (laughs) in my book, but it's also, you know, as I said at the beginning, I, you know, I wouldn't have spent 25 years being a human rights lawyer if I wasn't optimistic, I'd have given up and got a job in the city. Um, and and got with the program. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I am absolutely optimistic and I'm seeing things changing and yeah, I'm, I'm really excited actually about the future. And for me, you know, as we were talking about earlier, you know, for me, the most exciting thing would be able to engage with, with funders, investors, with technologists about, you know, what are their ideas for the technology of the future uh, and how I could help them think about that. I mean, I, I think that is the excitement. I don't know what the technological future is. But I'd love to be a part of, you know, designing what it is and, and talking to the people who have those incredible ideas. So yeah, I'm absolutely optimistic. I love it. 